Hi, AP Chem folks. This is Mrs. Johnson. I'm looking at page 19 in the chapter 15 notes. Um, this exercise 10 we're not going to do in this notes video, but I really encourage you to give it a shot on your own. I'm going to tell you the answer now, and then my hope is that you'll work towards it and see if you can come up with this answer. So the answer to this problem is 1 times 10 to the negative 6. Again, 1 times 10 to the negative 6. Um, that's a Ka value for an acid. So read through this problem, you're given some information, and then you're asked to find the Ka value of the acid. Treat this like an equilibrium problem or a titration problem, the same way we've been doing with all of them. Write down the major species if you don't know where to start. Think about what reaction is happening. If there's a neutralization reaction there, you're going to need to do reaction stoichiometry. Then you can go to equilibrium and use an ice table or a shortcut method to, um, to solve with what's left. Okay, so see if you can figure that out. Come see me if you need help with it. We are going to jump down to the bottom of page 19 and finish up by talking about acid-base indicators. So these are the substances we know we use in titrations, but we haven't talked a whole lot about them. We do know, however, that they change color in a certain pH range. That's their, their usefulness as an indicator is that they indicate when the pH goes from the acidic side to the basic side or something like that. That's at least how we have used phenolphthalein in the past. Um, the important thing to know about indicators is that they're usually weak acids. They can be weak bases, but weak acids are much more common. So we represent an indicator as HIN. If you think about how we represent a generic weak acid, we represent it as HA. The H is the hydrogen ion that the weak acid loses, and then the A is the, becomes the conjugate base, the A-. minus. Same thing with indicators here. This H represents a hydrogen that the indicator loses. Um, so once the indicator dissociates, it becomes H plus and IN minus. That's the conjugate base form. The thing to know about indicators, though, is that they're so weak, the dissociation is so tiny, that it really does not affect the pH. So we don't worry about the, the added H plus in our calculations because it is very, very insignificant. What is significant, though, is the color change that even just a few of those molecules undergo that allow us to see a color change in the solution. Right? So indicators usually have one color in the acidic form, HIN form, and then they have another color in the basic form. And that basic form is IN minus. That's how we represent a generic basic form. This is really important. Usually one-tenth of the initial indicator has to be changed to the other form before we see a color change. So when one-tenth of the HIN, if that's what we're starting with, when one-tenth of the HIN dissociates into IN minus and H plus, that's when we notice a color change in the, the solution or in our titration. And again, there's very little effect on the overall pH of the reaction, so we don't worry about um, calculating this when we're calculating pH. It does not affect the pH. And again, just terminology review, the end point of a titration is where the indicator changes colors. This is a qualitative piece of information. Um, we need our end point to match the equivalence point of the titration. Otherwise, it's not so good. We don't have a matchup, and we get false information about what the equivalence point is if we, if we have an endpoint that's incorrect. So when choosing an indicator, you'll oftentimes see questions about how to choose a good indicator for a titration that you're carrying out. Um, these are the things that you really need to know. Your book does a pretty good explanation, more in-depth, like breaking down formulas. I'm just going to give you the information here. So when choosing the indicator, we want the endpoint of the indicator and the equivalence point to be as close as possible. For strong acids, strong base titrations, we talked about this in class today. The equivalence point has a huge vertical region because we don't see any buffering, right? So there's a gigantic section of pH change for the equivalence point or where we see the equivalence point. That means that we can be kind of sloppy with our choice of pH indicator because at the equivalence point, a gigantic range of pHs is covered. Of, yes, of pHs is covered. <clears throat> so we can choose a wide variety from a wide variety of indicators for a strong acid, strong base titration. However, if we are talking about a weak acid titration or a weak base titration, we saw in some of those graphs today, the weak acid, weak base titrations don't have such a wide vertical range at the equivalence point. That means that we really need to be careful about what indicator we choose because it needs to change color within that small, slim margin um, where the equivalence point occurs. So let's talk about phenolphthalein. That's one that we have used before. We know it starts off colorless, and then 
think in your head what color it goes to. Hopefully you're thinking pink-ish. It goes to pink, and the reason it turns pink is when a certain proportion of the phenol phthalene has given off or dissociated into H plus and then the conjugate base, which we're going to represent as I and minus, just generic form. Interesting thing is that phenol, ph phenol phthalene is most effective or changes color from pH 8 to 10. So when about one-tenth of the phenol phthalene has dissociated, that's when um, it turns pink, and about one-tenth dissociates between pHs 8, 8 and 10. So that's when we see that color change. Um, we use phenol phthalene for a strong acid, strong base titration, which we know the equivalence point for that is at 7. Phenol phthalene does not change color at pH 6. Seven it changes between pH eight and ten. However, since we used a strong at, since we were doing a strong acid strong base titration, it was still effective because there's a large jump in pHs. So we still saw the color change occur um, right as we reached the equivalence point. So it was okay to use for our strong acid strong base titration. Again, when we're doing a weak acid base weak acid or base titration, we must be more careful. The useful range of an indicator is usually it's pKa plus 1. So that means whatever the pH at the equivalence point of the titration is, we want the pKa of the indicator to be within plus or minus 1 of the pH of the, the equivalence point. So you may be given some information. You may be given an equivalence point for... Um, a titration, and you may be asked from this list of indicators and their pKa's, which one is the most effective? So pH at the equivalence point and pKa should be very close together. Ideally, the pKa is within plus or minus one of the pH at the equivalence point. <coughs> so I'm just filling in the notes here. So this is a shorthand version. Again, um, I think there's some derivations in your books that are a good explanation of this, but this is something you just want to memorize because it can really shorten things up, kind of like um, that at one half equivalence point, pH equals pKa, something that you just need to have on hand. This is another one of those pieces of knowledge you just need to have on hand. You can compare the pH of a solution and a pKa of any acid that's in the solution. This includes indicators. You can also use the same information when we're talking about just a normal acid, acetic acid, um, ammonium in solution. You can compare the pKa and the pH, and that can give you some information about the major state of the acid. So is the acid uh, more in its undissociated form, or is it more in the dissociated form? All right, so I've squeezed in a couple of things that I think will be helpful to reference here. This first one is the HH equation the henderson hasselbalch equation, and then right next to it on the right, we have my um, shortened version of the equation. And then in each case, I've just rearranged them because you may find it helpful to look at them in a different way. So I rearranged the HH equation for pKa, and then I rearranged the shortened version for just Ka. So let's consider a situation where we have a pH that's larger than the pKa of whatever acid we're given. This could be an indicator that we're looking at because most indicators are acids. It could be an acid in solution. If the pH is larger than the pKa, check out this henderson hasselbalch equation. <clears throat> Which form of our um, acid is going to be more dominant? The base form, which is on the, the top of our fraction, or the acid form, which is on the denominator? Um, you should make, should make sense to you that the base form is going to be do more dominant. So if we have a pH that's larger than pKa, that means that this A minus in the numerator must be greater than the HA in the denominator. And you can sort of use that reasoning with any of these other equations. Um, I put them up there because I tend to look at them slightly differently, but I think that's probably the way, this is the way that's going to make more, most sense for you. Um, the other way you could think about it is that if the pH is greater than the pKa, that means the concentration of H plus is greater than the Ka. If the concentration of H plus is greater, that means there must be conjugate base present because the acid has dissociated. So it's existing mostly in its dissociated or basic form. Okay, if the pH is smaller than the pKa, this is the exact opposite situation. So looking back at this HH equation, we have a pH that's lower than the pKa. That means that we must have mostly the acidic form, or the HA, undissociated present. Okay. It's going to pull this value down. 
looking at maybe the simplified equation, that means the H plus in the solution is going to be less than the Ka. So we've got a lower pH, mostly the acid form present. Greater pH, mostly the base form present. You can also think about it that way. It's pretty simple. All right, and then for this last example problem, bromothymol blue, it's an indicator. It has a Ka value of 1 times 10 to the negative 7. So that's a pretty tiny Ka value. We're not going to consider it for pH, um, affecting the pH, but it certainly is helpful in a titration. It's yellow form. It's, it is yellow in its HIN form. So that's its undissociated form. It's blue in the IN minus or the conjugate base form. If we put a few indicators, drops of this indicator in acidic solution, if the solution is titrated with sodium hydroxide, at what pH will the color change first be visible? So the thing to remember here is that a color change occurs. We, we start to notice a color change when one-tenth of our indicator goes from the acidic form to the, the basic form. So we have to see one-tenth of the indicator become dissociated. So let's write out the reaction that's happening with the indicator here. Don't worry about the titration going on. Let's think about what's happening as we... Um, What's happening to the indicator? So the indicator is HIN. It undergoes a reversible reaction to its basic form, IN minus, and H plus. So using the relationship above, actually, skipped ahead of myself, let's write out the K value for this indicator. The K value for the indicator, the K expression, would be H plus times IN minus divided by concentration of HIN. So I'm treating this pretty much like an equilibrium problem. I have a balanced reaction. I wrote out the K expression. And then let's think about what we know. Maybe we can use this to calculate um, the H plus concentration, which would take us to pH. right? So we said from the get-go that we have to have one-tenth of the indicator undergoing that the dissociation to see a color change. So that means that the concentration of IN minus over the concentration of HIN must be one-tenth. We can do um, some quick work here and actually do some substitution where we take one-tenth and plug it into our Ka expression. That would leave us with Ka is equal to H plus divided by 10. And we know the Ka value. Sorry, I don't know what I'm doing here with this new, um, new technology. Right, so see if you can start working it out from here. I'll write out the Ka expression. We should end up with 1.0 times 10 to the negative 7. That's the Ka value we're given. And we know that that should be equal to the concentration of H plus divided by 10 once we make that substitution. We can solve for the H plus concentration then, and that's telling us when the H plus concentration gets to this level, that means we're going to see an indicator change. So we can use that to solve for pH. So you solve for concentration of H plus, use that H plus to solve for the pH, and you should come up with a pH value of 6.00. And hopefully this is something that you could do without a calculator. You really don't need a calculator for this question. Right? Um, we'll pick up here in class, or excuse me, go over the homework in class before we start the lab. Please, please, please um, come to class prepared to do the lab. Um, you shouldn't be working on the pre-lab in class. Right? So come see me if you have any questions. Send me an email. I will respond as quickly as possible. Have a great afternoon.